Okay, folks, welcome to um, week 10. And what um, I hope it's going to go fast uh, because I'm sure we're all tired and just waiting for this week to be over with. So, um, yeah. Um, a few announcements before we begin. Um, today, we're going to start our um, what is a short um, security module in which we're going to talk about um, a few important or relevant um, issues with current operating system security and just security in general. Um, and we're going to have our guest lecture on, um, on Friday. Um, other than that, the announcements are I have posted Milestone 3 Checkpoint 2. That is going to be due not this one Thursday, but next Thursday. That's going to be the last day of finals. Um, that's when you can, um, that's the last time where I can actually accept any assignments uh, because I have to do great things before one. Um, second thing is I posted the advanced assignment for our security, advanced security lab. So you can find it on the course schedule. Um, you should have received an email from me about downloading and installing a new VM. Um, unfortunately, um, we have to have a 32 bit environment, otherwise, it's going to make your life a lot, a lot harder um, to implement the attacks that we're going to be implementing. So um, just install that um, virtual machine um, by hopefully by tomorrow, which when we're going to get to doing the actual attacks together, so you can actually do them while we're, um, we're going over them. Um, in class. Uh, and it's going to be, so I made the due date on Sunday, but I, I urge you to submit on Friday just to leave your, your weekend free for if you have any final. Um, we do not have a final for this class, so we just have two more deliverables, the um, security assignment at the end of this week and the um, project milestone at the end of that next Thursday. All right, questions? Okay, so before we begin, I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor. I want this piece of paper to get to Ryan all the way in the back. So if you can please just find a way to get it to, to Ryan. Is it the other way around? <laughs> All right, got it. You can open. So, um, I just sent a message from me to Ryan. Right, it contains some very sensitive information that he's going to be happy with. Um, but what do you think are the problems with what we just did? It. You could have read it, right? Right? Anyone, any one of you, it, it went through many hops, right? At least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hops to get there. Any one of you, eight people, could have been a, a bad person and just opened the message and read it, right? The message actually contains a credit card number, a fake credit card number, but yeah, you know? Um, so the first thing we, we thought about is what we call Let's use black color. Um, confidentiality. Which says that a secret message uh, should, should remain secret. So it was a secret message between me and Ryan, and it should stay that way, no matter how many hops it go through, no matter how, no matter how many people get the message across. All right, other than that, what other problems do you think there could be? Other than someone reading the message? Authentication. Authentication kind of falls under confidentiality, right? Because the only, only Ryan is supposed to read, read that message. He's author, authorized to read the message. None of you are authorized. Yeah. Yeah. So this A is not for authentication. 
Jordan. Yeah, exactly. So that's problem number three, which is availability. Availability. Yeah. So availability makes means that our system is up and running, and no user should take it down. So we shouldn't get to a point where someone either just hogs the entire system or prevents by you know by their 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 careless they drop they drop messages for example on the way someone just throws the message away couldn't have gotten to um to, to its destination so other than that what do you think are there could be other problems Thank you. yeah <laughs> So let's say, I don't know where the message path. Yeah. What, let's say, where did the message go? Um, Dylan, did it go through you? OK, let's say Dylan had a pen. What could he have done? Change the message. So this is what we're going to call the concept of integrity, which is making sure that only authorized users can change the message. So if I, um, conf confidentiality deals with the fact that no one should read the message. Integrity means that no one should write to the message, right? Except for the people who are authorized to do so. So what we have just seen now is commonly referred to as the CIA triad. So C for confidentiality, I for integrity, and A for availability. Um, commonly, this is what you're going to see in security textbooks as the definition of all things security. It's going to fall under one of these. It's like an umbrella acronym under which all thoughts of security and um, you know defenses, attacks is going to fall under um, all three of those, um, or one of one or more of these three. However. Take that with a grain of salt, right? There's a big debate among the um, the computer security community whether this is enough. Does this contain everything? Do we need more? Um, you know, the, the stuff that researchers and you know academics kind of fight about all the time: definitions, right? So um, you, you might see that someone else is going to come out and say like, "Oh, CIA sucks. We're just going to go and do something else," right? So um, I think it's a good way to start our discussion into security is to understand all those um, three different um, components of what um, security is, is composed of. Um, concerning availability attacks, as an example, um, you must have heard of the ransomware attack a couple of days ago, right, in the gas pipeline. Um, so that's what caused gas prices to shoot up. People were, were um, hoarding gas and so on. So this is an availability attack. A ransomware is basically locked the disks of everyone in the gas pipeline or all the computers in the gas pipeline and demanded ransom for them to unleash them. So this is an availability attack and it can also have drastic consequences. Another really big example of that one is in 2016, I think there was a moment in time, I think it's March or something like that, where all the big companies, the big names, Facebook, Amazon, and a bunch of other ones were down um, because there was this huge denial of service attack um, happening where people were flooding the internet with um, network packets and they um, just overloaded the network, couldn't get to um, service everyone. Yeah. Is that one of the ones you can set Cloudflare? And Cloudflare has been involved in many of them, so I'm not sure which one is what it was. I think this one was a, it's a it was against Dyn, the DNS provider. Um, so Cloudflare, I don't think we're involved in this one. Yeah. Okay. Questions? All right, so today 
we're going to be focusing on the second point. We're going to taking we're going to be taking a look at integrity and integrity attacks. Specifically, where we want to get to today is what we call control flow hijacking attacks. This is an L, not an L. Control flow hijacking attacks. But before we get there, we have to kind of build up our knowledge to be able to conduct such an attack. The first thing we're going to define is what is control flow. So control flow for a program, it's nothing but the flow of execution of the machine instructions or the lines of code or or instructions in the program. Can you give an example of a statement that influences the control flow of a program? So that changes the sequence of instructions? Yeah. Swap context is one of those, right? We're jumping and executing something else. So swap context. Other than, other than swap context. Yeah. Simply an if statement. Yeah, exactly. If statement changes the control flow of the program. Because when you're doing an if statement, you're standing at a branch in time, right? You either go through or you go to the false branch. You might be, you, they might merge later on, but you're standing at a branch in time. You're either going to go the true, true branch or in the false branch. <laughs> Other than that, for loops, while loops. Function calls, which is kind of similar to swap context, but less abrasive. Um, return statements and go to statements if you have used those before. All right, so all of these influence the control flow of a program. So let's take an example. Let's say I have if x less than 10, then I do x plus plus else I do x minus minus. So very simple example. Here's how we represent the control flow of this program. We get to a point in time where we have to check x is less than 10. Then if it's true, we do x plus plus. If it's false, we do x minus minus. Okay, so here's another example. Let's say we have a for loop. And then we're doing print f. Y. Okay, so how do we represent a for loop? We're gonna go down. First thing we're gonna execute in a, in a loop is i equals to zero. Then we're gonna ask ourselves the question, is i less than 10. If it's true, we're going to go to printf. But then once printf, and then i++, plus plus, and then we go back. We make the check again. If it's false, then we go to somewhere else and do some other business. All right, one more example, and that's going to lead us into where we want to go eventually. Let's say I have a function foo and does some, let's say, integer x equals to 3. And in, I, in my main function, I just call foo and I say y is equal to 5. So here's how this is going to look like. We are in main first. At this point, we're going to call foo. So what happens is that we're going to transfer execution from 
true from main into foo. We execute x is equal to three. Then we have to remember where do we go back to, right? So we foo called main, main is done, so we have to go back to, to main. That's the other way around. Main called foo, foo is done, foo comes back into main. So we need to go back in here and then continue executing y is equal to 5. So a control flow hijacking attack, which is the title of today's lecture, where we want to end up today, is when an attacker does the following. They are going to break this link and make this return statement go to bad code and do something like exec ve slash bin slash sh. So what the attacker is trying to do is they're going to overtake the flow of execution of your program. If your program is going to execute instruction X then instruction Y, the, the attacker is going to do instruction X, then instruction Z, which is somewhere else. It's going to cause your program to jump out of its normal behavior. Typically, you're going to see something that looks like this. What does the exact VE in SH do? Yeah. Like it raises it to the, like it raises your authority of it, so it's a root thing, and then it runs. Uh, close. It's not running a shell, but it's running it. Yeah, it's exactly running a shell. So this is gonna drop you, drop into a shell. And imagine this is, you did this thing. Then you drop into a root shell, which is even worse. And typically, attackers want you to when you when you click on those like um, three Adobe, I don't know, Adobe XE, you know those those very um, non 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 um, suspicious looking um, names, right? When you click on those, you're asked this: Do you want to run this as administrator? And you know because we are happy people to get. Um, we, are, we, are, we as people are happy to get things for free. We're going to click yes. I want to run this as admin. And then you drop it. Then the attacker can drop into a root shell. Right? When they have, once they have a root shell, they have complete control over your um, environment. They can encrypt your hard disk as a ransomware attack. They can do whatever they want um, outside of, um, of, of this specific. So here's how I like to think about um, this um, this specific attack. Imagine your control flow is a car. Every if statement or a for loop, you change the steering wheel to go from one branch to another. If there's a for loop, you go around in the loop in this case, right? What the attacker is going to do is going to yank that steering wheel off of your hands and take you into somewhere they control. Once you go into that place, this is where they execute whatever they want to execute. And the goal of today's lecture, um, hopefully if we get through all of it today, is to get you to a point where starting from a piece of code, you can actually conduct a um, uh, control flow hijacking attack. Uh, before we get started, a statement on ethics. Um, <laughs> you, kind of, you probably have heard this multiple times. Um, this, the idea I'm giving you is a very controlled environment. Um, please, 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 please do not attempt to do any of these things in the wild, right? If you are caught doing that, um, a lot of bad things can happen to you and to me. So, um, the, the easiest thing that can, that can happen is, um, you get, you know, dismissed from the university. But the worst thing that can happen, you can end up in jail, right? So please, please, please do not launch these attacks unless you have authority to do the authentication or authority to do so. 
Questions? Okay. So to figure out exactly how we're going to achieve this, how we're going to take over the control flow, we have to understand how a function call happens. And to understand how a function call happens, we're going to pay another visit, close visit to our dear old friend, the address space of a function. So we've probably seen this image about a, about a hundred times so far in this class, right? Text, data, heap grows up, stack goes down. This is the high address, and this is the low address. So has anyone not taken 230 or not seen a stack before? OK, so you know the basic. What are the basic two operations we need? We can do on a stack. Yeah. Off and push, right? So in order for us to do that, we need to maintain a stack point. So that tells us. Where the top of the stack is. If I want to push to the stack. Remember that the stack grows down, so push, I decrement the stack point. If I want to pop from the stack, I increment the stack point. So just make sure you distinguish between the two. When you decrement the stack pointer, this means you're adding space to your stack. When you increment the stack pointer, this means you're removing space from your stack. You're popping things off of the stack. So here's what we need to implement this stack. So we need um, the stack pointer, which is going to be stored in a register called ESP. Usually it's represented as a percentage ESP. This is a register that always contains the stack point. OK, the second thing that we know is that the, the, the bottom address of the stack is fixed. And the third thing we know is we can push and pop from the stack. OK. So when we call a function. We're going to push. A bunch. Of information. On the stack. And we call this collection of information a stack frame. Okay? When a function returns, we're going to pop its stack frame. So you can see now why it's helpful to have a stack. If I call a function, I push on the stack. Once that function returns, I pop from the stack. Right? So even if I have five fu uh, function calls um, that are like nested within each other, they're all going to do push, 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 push five times. Then when the first one returns, we're going to pop. So we pop the correct one. Then the next one and the next one, and the next one and the next one. Because the stack is a last in, first out data structure. So that's the benefit of, its st of the stack. But what does the stack frame contain? And this is where we're going to be spending plenty of time. The stack frame contains the following information. One, 
parameters of a function. Okay. Second thing is local variables of a function. And third thing is some information to perform return operation. Most importantly of this piece of information is what we call the return address. So this is where the execution is going to continue when the function returns. So if we go back to our example in here, initially this point here was foo's return address. Okay. Questions so far? All right. So one more thing. So now we have, let's let's draw this stack now. Forget about the other pieces of memory. We have our local vary or our arguments. We have our return address. We have a few things in between, and then we have our local variable. And this is our stack point. Now, do you see any issues if we refer to, let's say, this argument or the arguments in here as an offset from stack pointer? Do you see any issues with that? So if I, the only thing I remember is what's the offset of the arguments from the stack point? Do you see any issues with that? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the, the stack pointer moves dynamically. So we can't really offset from the stack pointer without too much trouble. So in addition to that, what we will keep track of is what we call the frame pointer, which is another pointer which is going to be fixed right after the return address. So this is the frame pointer. It's typically stored in the EBP register. The frame pointer is just a fixed address that we can use to get to the arguments and get to the return address. So it's another register. We have one register for the stack pointer one register for the frame point. Okay. So let's see what happens on a function call. So if I call the function foo, the parameter is one, two, and three. Here's what's gonna happen. Step number one, push the arguments <coughs> of foo in reverse order. So we're going to take whatever our stack pointer is, and we're going to push the arguments of foo in reverse order onto the stack. So we're going to do three, two, one. Those are going to be on our stack. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to push the return address uh, um, on the stack. So let's say this is in main, so we can just refer to things. So this is this return address is going to be in main. Third thing we want to do 
because we want to restore the state to main as if it was we, we were never called, right? So what we're going to do is that we're going to save or push. Uh, let's reset this. Push mains frame point. So we're going to save the frame pointer of main so that we can reuse it for foo's frame. And finally, step four, we're going to allocate space for local variables. OK, so let's take an example and see this in, um, in action. Let's say we have the following example. Uh, yeah, so we have main. And it just calls a function with three parameters, one, two, and three. And function, it, all it does is allocate two buffers. Buffer one, size five. Buffer two, size 10. All right, so let's go ahead and see what happens when we call this function. First thing we're going to do, step one, push the arguments of foo or a function in reverse order. So this is our stack. Let's start off. This is main stack. And this is the stack pointer now. First thing we're going to do is push the arguments in reverse order. So we're going to push three push two and push one and move the stack one. So this is step one. Okay, next push the return address on the stack. So we need the return address of this function, of this place in our code. This is where we should go back to. So let's call this our address. So we're going to push our address on the stack. And then we're going to move our stack point. This is step number two. Step number three is push main's frame pointer. So we're going to take the main frame pointer of main. And save it. Step three. Oops. And we end up stack pointer green. Now what we're going to do between steps three and four is we're going to make the frame pointer of function point to this location that contains main's frame pointer. So the frame pointer of foo contains the address of the frame pointer of main. So that's just that's that's so you can easily tell them apart. Last thing we're going to do, we're going to allocate space for the local variables. So all we're going to do, we're going to allocate space for 15 bytes. So stack pointer is here. We have buffer one and buffer two. And this is where the stack pointer starts when um, we go back to business, when function starts executing. So does that make sense? Questions? OK, so let's take a look um, at this and see how it looks like in practice. So can you guys see this at the back? Okay. 
Um, so first of all, we're just going to look at the same code we were looking at. We have a function that has two buffers, 10 and 15, and then we're calling function with parameters 1, 2, 3. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to load this into GDB. And make sure you follow along. Um, you don't have necessarily to type this, but just follow along mentally because this is the process you're going to do for your assignments as well, for, for your assignment as well. OK, so we launched GDB. The first thing we're going to do, we want to see the actual machine instructions that are changing the state of our stack. So we can do that using the call to disassemble the main function. Oh, I rock. I put the wrong one. Okay. okay. So this is the machine by instruction by instruction um, state of main. You can see here these three calls are happening before we actually call function. We push the first parameter in reverse order, third parameter, second parameter, first parameter onto the stack. So these are the, the, the three thing, three thing, three things um, we saw in here. Step two is we save the return address. So this call to function actually does the save address. So what do you think is going to be stored in the return address? What's the value that's going to be stored in the return address? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we're going to store the next line in here. So this is going to be 0804, 0804, uh, 9A, F0. OK, so next, let's go and, and take a look what happens in function. So we're going to push EBP. So remember, EBP, let's go back in here. EBP is the frame point. It currently contains main's frame point. So we're going to save it onto the stack, which is exactly what we said we're going to do in here. Next, we're going to move ESP into EBP. So we're going to change the value of EBP, instead of pointing to whatever it was pointing to in main, we're going to make it point to the current top of the stack. So we pushed and we saved where the stack is. OK, so those two, those, this is what these two lines are telling us is happening. Here's how we allocate space on the, key, on the stack. This is very nice to do on the stack because all we have to do is just make room. Right? So if I need 20 bytes on, on, on the stack, I just move my stack pointer by 20 bytes and we're done. There's no need to do anything else. Right? So here we are subtracting hex value 10 from the stack pointer. So the stack pointer was here. Let's use a green color. Stack pointer was here. Remember, this is this grows down, right? So when I say increment, when I say push things on the stack, I'm actually decrementing the stack pointer. I'm moving the stack pointer towards the lower addresses. So we're going to decrement this by 16 bytes. To make room for buffer one and buffer two. Yeah. So is the stack pointer then by index? So like each number you move up on it, like there's another byte that you so like each, each. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. He, and and he's, he, it comes the, to in the answer to my next question. For you. So um, why did we move it 16 bytes instead of 50? So if you look at the source code, we had buffer of 5 and buffer of 10. But we moved stack pointer 16 bytes. Why do you think we did that? Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. So if you recall from your 132 um, class, we address memory by words, right? And a word is four bytes. So we always have to keep this in, in multiples of four. So that's why instead of allocating 15 bytes, we allocated 16 bytes. OK. Does this answer your question now? Yes. OK, awesome. So before we move along, um, I wanted to. Uh, show you another test example and then run it together to see what's going to happen. Here we have another function, but it does something better, much more interesting. We have X and Y, and we're doing X is equal to A plus B, and Y is equal to B minus C. So we're using the actual values and parameters that we have. So we're going to go in and try this again. So we can see that main did not change at all, right? Um, push three, push two, push one, call function. So let's put a breakpoint on function and run this code and see where we are now. So we are, we have done the push to EBP, we have done the move, we have done the subtraction. You can ignore these two, um, you don't have to worry about them for now. Um, so what do you think these or these four lines of code are doing. So if you don't know syntax of um, x86, this is move the contact contents of EBP plus eight into the register EBX. So move EBP plus eight into EBX. So what is EBP plus eight? Yeah. So remember that this is negative, but it's 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 a good idea. This is positive. So we're moving up instead of down. So instead of moving to buffer one, we're actually going to move eight bytes up. Into this is A, B and C. Right, so we're going to move into A. And we're going to move the content of this address into EDX. So let's take a look at what happens once we execute this instruction. So what um, one thing you can do in um, GDB is you can execute instruction by instruction. Yeah. Yes. So let's print. So to print the content of a register. Um, let's do EBP. So EBP. Contains now this value which is the frame pointer of main, because this is where EBP is. EBP is here, this is the frame pointer of main. So let's see what EBP plus 8 contains. And that's our first argument. If I do EBP plus 4, what do you think this is? Can you say that? The return address. To confirm this, Take a look at this guy. And take a look at this guy. They're exactly the same. So this is where the function should return after it's um, called. So let's see what happens when we uh, if, if you want to dump the contents of the registers, you can do info registers and it just dumps the contents of EAX, ECX, EDX, EBX, ESP and all of those um, functions out of those um, registers. So let's go back to um, seeing where we are in function. A nice thing you can do in um, GDB, you can work instruction by instruction. So you don't have to work line by line. You can ask GDB to execute one in machine instruction and another machine instruction and so on and so forth. So to move till after the execution, let's move one instruction 
So we are now here. Let's take a look at the address or what's contained in EDX. So EDX contains some, I don't know, some value now. I don't know what that is. So let's move forward two steps till after the execution of this guy. And now EDX contains, or it's, yeah, EDX contains the value one. Or if you want to see it, EDX contains one. So now, putting these things together, what do you think this piece of code is doing? So we accessed A, what do you think we're going to be doing next? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're accessing 12 bytes from EBP. Let's see what's in 12 bytes from EBP. It's two, which is the, the parameter B. Then we are adding them up together and we are storing them in minus four from EBP. So now we're moving down the stack, right? And minus four from EBP is nothing but X, which is our first local vector. So let's execute this, this piece of code. And I think we need two more instructions. One more. Okay, and let's look at EBP minus four. And now it contains the value three, which is one plus two. Okay, so now with all of this happening, what do you think the attacker's target is going to be? How do they get a hold of the steering wheel? Yeah. So changing EBP might be one thing to do. So basically you crash the, the program if you change EBP, right? So what if I don't want to crash the program? I want the program, once it does something, to go and execute my code instead of going to execute someone else's code. Yeah. Exactly. So this is exactly what um, we're going to be doing, um, I think, tomorrow, which is how do I change this so that instead of returning to main, I return to super nasty function, right? So that's what we were going to be looking for at um, tomorrow. Before I let you go, let's quickly go over the um, security lab. Um, parts one and part two, we're going to be doing to get together in class tomorrow. Um, so if, if you want to wait until tomorrow to get started, we're going to have a good start together. Um, and do those um, two problems at the same time at, or, or together. You can see that each problem has a star rating next to it. This star rating is the level of difficulty and should give you how much time should be an indicator of how much time you should be spending on each problem. You can see we have two very hard problems. You, you only have to do one of them. So you can choose six or seven and do one of them. If you want extra credit or extra 20 points, you can do both, but, but just to get the full grade, you only have to do one of those uh, two problems. Um, so the source code is over here. There's a lot of information. Um, we're gonna be doing that. Um, we're, doing, we're gonna be doing parts one and parts two together tomorrow in class. So unless you have um, any other questions, that is it for today. Yeah. For which? Do we get the source code for the plan? Yeah, yeah, everything is posted. Yeah.